booming market. Residential valuation stack up. We're about to find out. Joining us today from Karen Todd White, Director of Residential Division uh, in Sydney, New South Wales, we have Matthew Hells. Hello, Matthew. Hi, guys. Thank you for having me. No worries. Thank you for coming. Welcome. <laughs> It is a question that we get asked all the time in the market that we are, which is uh, which is booming. How do actually valuations stack up? So uh, to, before we start on that uh, topic, if you can give us a bit of a background about yourself, about Heron Todd White valuations, and then we'll kick off into this uh, answering this question. Um, yeah, I've been a property valuer since uh, the early 2000s, probably, probably longer than I'd care to admit. Um, Okay. And been with Heron Todd White for the last 12 years. Um, yep. We're an uh, Australia-wide um, company, uh, the largest uh, independent valuation company in Australia. Um, obviously, I've got a bit more of a Sydney, bent, uh, Sydney focus in my role. Mm. Um, we've got three offices or two offices currently, but traditionally we've had three offices across Sydney. Um, yep. And we do residential valuations, commercial valuations, and we also have an advisory division which specialises in government and institutional work. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And uh, how we actually came across, um, other than uh, Gadeb coming across them yeah. all the time, Harren Todd White with the valuation. A lot of the valuations we order for business come through you guys. <laughs> is um, the monthly report that gets generated, month in review. Uh, that's something that we refer to quite uh, often with our clients um, when we are talking about how's the market. Uh, you know, we're, we're in the market uh, cycle we are. So we'll be bringing that uh, to you guys shortly as well. Um, and because this is an interactive show, do feel free to. Um, put in your comments. We'll be happy to answer any questions as we are live. Uh, but yeah, coming back to the questions, valuations. Let's get. Let's talk about the the basic overview of the process of valuations and what is currently happening in the current market. Yeah, so I guess you know most people have probably had a their property valued at some stage. But um, for those that haven't, I guess the role of the valuer is, you know, when we're talking about a mortgage valuation, is to go and assess the value of the property for the lender so they can base their lending decisions um, off that report not only off the off the value of the property but there's other factors involved that sort of help shape the risk profile of a, of a property mm -hmm. um, and and essentially the way we do that is is we go out and assess market value which is um, you know willing buyer willing seller you know acting prudently so we'll look at um, properties in the area that have sold. We'll try and find, find properties that that's uh, similar to the property that we're valuing, mm. and that's that's sort of how we assess value. Mm. Now, one of the questions we get asked um, is about uh, yeah, the, refinance. Yeah, um, what we're talking offline is sometimes with refinance applications, the property valuation coming in a little bit more conservatively than it's a purchase contract. Mm. Um, what are your it, instructions from the bank? You know, is that something that the bank is asking you or how do you normally value those? No, we're, we're sort of under no instructions from the bank. The, the, the valuer's role is to assess market value. So essentially what, what we think the property would sell for as at that time. Um, the bank has some other levers that they can pull when they're looking at, at you know, what, what they want to lend to someone. But no, the valuers are under no instruction to value conservatively. Yeah. Mm. And another question we get asked is if the property is worth more than what they've paid for, would the, would the valuer value it more uh, than, than, the, than the purchase price? Uh, yeah, I mean, we obviously have regard to purchase price. And if it's a, you know, a, a, a typical sales situation, you know, it's on the market and it's been marketed to a, to a wide sort of range of people, then, you know, we have pretty high regard of that. But if it's a private sale or it's a transfer between um, family members, then it's still our role to assess the market value. So we'll, we'll put what we think it's worth and we'll let the bank know that it's sold for less. Um, and then it's, it's up to the bank from there. Of how much they yeah. lend, yeah. And in terms of um, the main concern uh, these days is that when when the at an auction, when the property, when there's a bit of a bidding wall and the prices do jump significantly, more often than not, those property prices are also coming at the contract price. So how does that, um, you know, what's your insights on that, you know, in a booming market uh, when the you know buyers are willing to pay more mm -hmm. than what the property would be worth because the price is, prices are basically changing every week every week. Increasing every week so mm. yeah. so how does that impact valuations yeah look it, it certainly provides challenges um yeah if if i'm valuing a property that's sold today I've, I've got to look back and use sales that 
have sold in the past and mm. and they can be as you know as much as you know four six eight weeks old because there's a lag time between a, a property selling and settling mm. and, and yeah. going into the databases that we use so it does provide challenges mm. however again we we come back to that mm. principle of market value being a willing buyer and a willing seller um yep. yeah and you got to have a high regard to that in an auction situation you know if to use a round number, let's say a property sells for $2 million. Um, you might have five underbidders between $1.9 and $2 million. Now that's a pretty strong indicator that that a market price is achieved. But, mm. you know, there may be a case at an auction when there's five bidders and it gets to $2 million and, and someone just wants to get rid of the other bidders. So they might offer $2.2 .2 million. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Now, are they acting prudently? In that situation, they, they, they may or may not be, but we've kind of, it's still based on sales and it's, it's still based on that premise of market value. Mm, yeah. There you go. Largely okay. speaking, largely speaking, even in a booming market like today, from what I see, you know, the vast majority of, of um, sales are, are coming in at contract price. And contract right. price. Exactly. And that's yeah. what been, that's has been the, yeah. you know, 99.9% .9 yeah. of the time yeah. when our buyers have purchased a property, it has come at contract, contract price. Yeah. So it's been very rare. Very, that con pretty ever, consistent. Pretty yeah. consistent. Yeah. Um, if we can just move to commercial valuations for a minute. With commercial valuation, a little bit different when valuing. So normally when we do valuation for residential, it's land construction or home improvements. With commercial, it's we've got, we start, we've got a factor in the lease as well, if it's a rental. Uh, when doing the commercial valuation. And normally what I've seen is if there's a fit out in the office, obviously values don't really take note of that. Like it's not really a benefit. Yeah, typically a commercial valuation is more, you know, sort of done on the cash flow or yeah. you know, an income basis. Um, but it depends what kind of asset it is and, and, and that um, mm. in terms of the particulars there. Um, mm. Not my, not my strongest suit commercial valuation, yeah. but I keep my yeah. hand in occasionally. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. just in a, in a nutshell. Um, so moving on to the property clock. So I wanted to bring up, and I'll be uh, asking for your insights on what you have seen in the market of Hills District, where we are at. So firstly, for those of you that haven't uh, seen this, I'm just going to bring this up. There we go. That's... Uh, and we share this here we go so let's just if you can just confirm you can see that yep yep can see that perfect okay um so this is something on a one piece of paper that basically shows how the markets around Australia are doing and it is very rare to see so many markets at one end of the of the clock which is where we are right now majority are in starting to offer recovery rising market and approaching peak um, so let's just can you just give us a bit of an um, uh, update on this and how, how you how you see this and what are, what is the timeline between one uh, segment to the other yeah, so yeah, we just call this our property clock, um, which is in our month monthly uh, month in review publication, mm. um, and it's a really quick visual just to give you an idea of where. As I said, we're a national company, so you get a really mm. quick visual of where some different markets are at. Mm. And you're right; it's very rare to see such large parts of the country in a rising market, um, mm. especially on the on the back of the pandemic. I'm not sure too many people predicted that. Yeah. Mm. Um, so yeah, as you can see, the vast majority of the countries that are rising market, but typically, you know, you've got the peak of the market, a declining market, the bottom of the market, and then the rising market. And I think what we've seen over the last oh, 10 to 20 years is, is the gap between the bottom of a market and the peak of a market has gotten shorter. Traditionally, it was maybe, you know, 10 years, something like that. But I'd say the last sort of property peak in Sydney is probably generally considered 2017. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then also I think the drop-off uh, typically now is, is, is not as dramatic as it has been in the past. Um, you know, with, mm -hmm. the last, with the last peak in 2017, there was probably some government intervention with APRA that saw... Um, that saw the slow slowing of the property market and mm. yeah values came back but not dramatically and it didn't take much for things to to kick again as we're seeing mm. now 
Yeah. Yeah. Mm. And then the other interesting one, so that's houses. So Sydney is naturally here in the rising market and uh, units are at the start of recovery. So one of the things that we've also noticed um, and a is there's a huge discrepancy or a gap between purchase price of a, um, a unit and a return that you get in a unit versus a house. And But that's starting to sort of close a little bit with the houses becoming so um, you know uh, unaffordable for some people that they're now coming back to units, which is more in the affordability range, the first home buyers and so on. Um, how, how do you see this? How, what's your comparison for the two? Yeah, I think you're right. I think... Um we're seeing a little bit more activity with units and, and some of that is being driven um, by the, by the you know, acceleration of the traditional um, housing market. Mm. Um, I think the unit market in Sydney is obviously um, being hampered by some um, you know, well-publicised um, building issues. Yes. Um, yeah. So that sort of put a bit of a handbrake on that. Um, there's always supply and demand factors at play with units, um, as well as you know, you know, we're not seeing any immigration on the back of COVID. Um, yeah. So I think there's been a lot of factors that have um, sort of meant that the unit market has sort of just operated at a, at a vastly different sort of rhythm than mm. the dwelling market in Sydney. But yeah, we're sort of seeing starting to see a, a return in that space. Yeah, and especially due to COVID, I think people want to live with more space yeah. and people are moving away from the, the units. Yeah, that's been the big thing that, that yeah. we've found that that sort of anywhere two hours in a ring outside of the CBD is just been you know extremely competitive to purchase property purchase, yeah yeah, yeah. 100%. yeah so if i now bring up um the uh bit of feedback on where uh the market is in northwest sydney um so yeah can we just talk a little bit about that and about your take on that yeah this is um we, this is in our september month in review we just um had a look at the vacant land market in the in the northwest so mm. yeah new estates mm. like box hill or um you know, land within existing suburbs like Bella Vista. Um, yeah. yeah. And we've, we've really seen strong growth over the last six to 12 months. Um, mm, yeah. you know, we're talking 50, 60% in some instances. Yeah. yeah. Um, which is really interesting. Uh, I think one of the driving factors there is if, if you go to buy an existing dwelling, you might be competing with, you know, 20, 30 people you know, at a minimum, um, you know, prior to sort of lockdowns and, and open homes. Mm -hmm. whereas typically land will get you know there might be released in, in clumps so it's a little bit less competitive so um, people have been keen to get in and, and buy their own land and, and, and build mm -hmm. um, but yeah it's, it's it's just been a really interesting trend that we've noticed um, the, the sort of resurgence of vacant land we, yeah. we do know that probably supplies at a, at a not an all-time low but it's probably as low as it has been in the last three to four years yeah. yeah, it's very low. I think a lot with a lot of land releases, it's only coming up, you know, 10, 15 blocks. You mm. know, you got they deliver they're drip feeding. Drip, drip they're feeding, deliberately yeah. drip I think a lot of buyers are missing out. Feeding. So um yeah, land and all of the all the developers um all the builders are basically taking the land. There's not much land out available out there for the general public as well. So mm. yeah, land is scarce. It is land <laughs> is king. <laughs> No, perfect. Any other um, insights or any anything else that uh, you'd wanted to highlight in the overall market that you've seen? Any other trends? Um, no, I, I, we sort of talk about this a bit, um, but we kind of are of the opinion that um, yeah, we're not at the peak of the market yet. I guess as, as indicated in our one. property plot. Um, yeah. I think there's a number of factors at play that we'll continue to see. Um, you know, property growing value, I would expect the rate in which it's sort of currently increasing to, to slow. I, I don't think that's sustainable at current yeah, level. The level um, yeah. Ultimately, you know, interest rates are low. Um, you know, in saying that, obviously, upper is sort of um, moved to sort of bring in a bit of a handbrake with how they're assessing serviceability and the like. But, mm. you know, to counter that, like I said, you know, we're probably going to be in a position to see, you know, immigration come back in the next six to 12 months. Yeah. Um, a lot of infrastructure projects which have slowed over the last, you know, over the term of the pandemic, they will sort of kick back in the gear. Um, so, yeah, so I think 
I think um, there's, there's cause to say that the prices will continue to rise, but I think that really strong heat should come out of the market. Mm, mm, but yeah. yeah, absolutely. Well, there you go. Well, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate, um, you know, valuation is one of those uh, interesting yeah. things that we, we yeah. often well, yeah, and uh, do definitely sign up to the publication, Karen Todd White's um, Month in Review, if you are interested and keen to know more and get those regular monthly updates of the property clock, where that is sitting, how the market's moving. Typically speaking, in our experience from one sort of segment to another, we've seen about you know, from the bottom of the market to uh, the next um, uh, slice, uh, about three to five years of where the growth comes in or the change comes in. So if we are to see that the market at uh, Sydney is starting to to peak uh, and the actual peak, we've still got a couple of years to get to that stage as well. So thank you very much for your time. Any final words before you finish off? No, thanks for having me. And yeah, if people do want to subscribe to the month in review, just punch Aaron Todd White in the Google. It'll take you to our website. It's it's pretty easy to do. Absolutely. No Thank you very much for your time again. And we'll see you guys next time. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Thank you.